I've been sharing with you about hearing the word of God. How do you know God speaks to you? How do you know that is the Lord directing you? How do you know what you're doing is the will of God? And that's what we have been discussing. All right. And I gave you a checklist. I told you one of the ways is you always recognize that God speaks to you in context. He doesn't speak in abstract. He always speaks in context, which means you look at your life from the time you're born to the time you die. You will find that there is that golden thread that goes through the fabric of your life. So you can see God speaking and directing and guiding you. It won't be something that is out of the blues, you know, something that <coughs> is out of context. Then you will find that what he says to you will line up with what the forefathers tell you. Remember I told you, your biological father, your spiritual father, your marketplace father, and of course God the Father. Now some of you may not recognize who your spiritual father is or who is the marketplace father. It's very simple. Let me tell you, if you want to find out, if you don't want, we cannot do anything. There is safety in persons of authority. Like the father in the house, you cannot go wrong, he's the chief priest. If it's his house, he's the father in the house, he is the authority. A boss in a firm is the authority. A husband in a relationship is the authority because the Bible says so clear and God works within that framework. Okay, So you can recognize the authority and when you find that it's in line with that authority, he will confirm that this is the word of the Lord for you. Yes, God is directing you. Go along. Then I shared with you that you also must look at the prophecies over your life because you will find that God intermittently sends messengers to direct you in the way you must go. Just like he sent Nathan to David and said, David, you are that man. Just like he sent Elijah to Ahab to say, Ahab, there shall not be rain. God will send prophets your way. So when you record your prophecies, you will feel, you will see there is consistency. I shared that with you. Then I said, look at the supernatural encounters that you have when God tells you to do something or when you're doing something in the will of God, you will find there are supernatural encounters. You meet people that extraordinarily is there. You, know, you never expected them to be there, but suddenly they meet and they meet your need. They give you the direction. They give you the guidance. You need a license. You need a housing. Take Cheryl's case. Lord, I'm praying for housing. Suddenly you meet somebody who says, come, this is the place you go to. This is where you apply. This is how you get it and you get it. Lord, I need a job. Suddenly you find God directing you because it is the will of God. You are in the will of God. You are hearing God. You're moving in God. So supernatural people, like when we decided, when we heard the Lord say, go to Melbourne, we waited. God sent Tanny King. God sent Reverend Ronald Wee. God sent Sally from Singapore. God sent all these so supernatural encounters in a short space of time. He sent so many people. Apart from supernatural people, uh, encounters with people, I said you must look for supernatural provision. If it is God who is leading, he will provide. There will be a donkey for the king if it's God who is leading, if Jesus wants that donkey. There will be a gold coin in the fish's mouth if Jesus wants to pay that tax. So there will be provision for you. There will be a house waiting for you. There will be a widow in Zarephath waiting to feed you. There will be ravens. There will be a brook. There is supernatural provision. If God is leading you, if God is directing you. So you know when God is speaking, you will know that there are supernatural events. If it's natural, it's not God. I mean, it can be God, but what I'm trying to say is, it is not an indication that it is. One of those checks, tests that you give to know that God is speaking. So apart from supernatural events like giving you, suddenly you get extra money, you get a house, you get a car, direction, provision, looking out for that, you will find that <clears throat> end of the day, it all falls into place. I also told you, you must take the first step. Don't run in the direction because you get into a problem. What if it's not God? Then you're in a mess. God said to give up my job. God said this, God said, suddenly you find you get a job, now, now you're, you've got no job and you're struggling. Now I don't know whether it's God or not. Too late. So you take a step. You take one step. You know, so you try applying for jobs. You try say, "What well, God? What do you want me to do? Let me try." And when you take the first step, suddenly you find the doors open. God is like that. He operates with everybody the same way. 
you know, similar way, not same way, similar way. Take the first step, then God says, listen, I'll take the next step with you. Take the next step, I'll take the next step. You know, that's what God did. So I gave you all this, so get last week's message. Please get last week's message. Hear it in context and you will know that God is speaking to you. Now, we want to study the life of Abraham. <clears throat> Why do you want to study the life of Abraham? Because Abraham's life is a life of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please, please God. So we must have faith. So Abraham's life shows us the type of faith he had, the type of faith God is looking for, the type of way to hear the voice of God. How did Abraham hear the voice of God? Because we want to hear the voice of God. Abraham had to leave his home and go into a far country. Abraham had to really leave his relatives, leave his friends, and follow the voice of God. It's a lot to do, you know, to leave something that's familiar and go. How did he hear? How does he know the voice of God? We also want to hear. We also want to know how God speaks to us. So we want to learn from Abraham. So let's look at Abraham's life. When you look at Abraham's life, you will find that God first told Abraham, come out of the earth, Chaldees, come out from your relatives, come out from your friends, your neighborhood, come out from the place you were. God told him that. But like us, Abraham also had problems because God can say, come out, but how do I leave my loved ones? God will say, when you marry, leave and cleave. cleave. Right. The Lord says, but how many of us follow? I can testify from my own life. It's very difficult. You will take your mother and father with you. Because you have your own understanding of what is right. You know better than God. So you think that I want to show that I love my mother. God, you said honor your father and mother. And you do that to your detriment. I want to share that with you because God is very clear. When I say something, you do it. And when you do it, you will see the power and the glory of God coming into your life at a different level. The anointing, the release, the blessing is tremendous. You know? So God said, come out of your relatives. Come out, telling Abraham, come out. But Abraham said, no, I'll go with my father and my brother. And we all will go to Haran. And I'll take my nephew along. So he felt it is all right. So he goes there, nothing happens. Abraham is a young man. I don't know, maybe 30, 40, I don't know. He's a young man, full of strength, with a beautiful wife, with his father and his nephew. Father dies, because God's will will come to pass. Father dies. And still Abraham carries on with his nephew Lot. He has not fulfilled what God told him at the beginning. What did God say? Come out from your relatives. Come out from your father's house. Come out from your environment. But he, he still carried on with his relatives, with his father's house. He still carried on with his environment. And the Lord said to Abraham, Yvonne, can you read that? <coughs> Genesis 13, 14 and 15. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward, for all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Amazing. And the Lord said to Abraham, when? When did the Lord speak again to Abraham? After. After the Lord had separated from him. You know, this God is like this. His words are very precious. He's not going to waste it. You know, we like to talk a lot. We tell the child 10, 25 times, you know. He tells you once. I already told you. I recognize you as a man. I recognize you as an adult. I told you, do this. And you didn't. And I'll wait. I'll wait till your father dies. I will wait. I will wait. And I will wait till you're ready for the next word. And after Lot had separated from Abraham, God spoke to Lot again. And he says, Lot, this promise that I wanted to give you all this while, now I can give you. Abraham, yes, this promise, Abraham, that I want to give you, I can give you now because you have listened 
to me. The Lord said, separate. It must be very painful for Abraham to separate because I got a nephew. I've got a few nephews who I love very much. In fact, I love them like my own sons. I call them son. Because truly my mind knows no distinction. I see them as my sons, you know. So I know how Lot is feeling. Because when you are married and you don't have children for a long time, you know, these ch the other children become, Abraham, sorry, Abraham becomes like your son. I mean, Lot becomes like your son, you know, um, just like Lot was to Abraham. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is it must have been very painful for Abraham to say, Lot, go your way. I know it's very painful for me when Levi said he wanted to leave the house and go his way. Sit down. Very painful. Very painful to separate. But do you want God's will for your life? Or do you want your own cushy life for yourself? Depends. You want to lead your life? Go ahead. Do whatever you want. Or you can follow what the Lord has told you to do. The Lord will make it clear in so many ways. So I know the pain. I'm not saying the Lord said to separate with regards to Levi. I, I didn't say that. But I know the pain that Lord went through. I, I can feel it. The tears, the pain. Because Lord took, Abraham took Lord like a son to him. So Abraham would have felt that pain, you know. But he still wanted to listen to God. And said, Lord, go your way. Once Lord had separated from Abraham, how do you think Abraham felt? I can tell you I've experienced it. You feel an emptiness. You feel the smile that you used to see, the correction you used to give, the guidance you used to give, no longer you can give. There's nobody to give it to. The plans you had for him. You know, all that is gone because the person is gone. But the Lord had to do that. And what does God do when, 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 when Abraham is faced with that loneliness, that pain? God begins to say, look, look at what I have for you. Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward. Come on, look at the promises I have in store for you. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants. You will have descendants, Abraham. And not only for the time being. I'm going to give it to you for ever. It's an everlasting covenant. It's an everlasting covenant. Abraham, I know your heart's desire. I know. So when Lot separates with you, I want you to look at the promise that I've given you. The assurance. Sometimes God says, give up a job. Oh, I cannot. It is my lot and I'll stick with it. Because I brought Lot from way back in my life. How can you ask me to give it up now? Sometimes God will say, give up this relationship that you have with this person. Because it's not meant to be. I have a better plan for you. No, I know. I love this person. This is my first cut. You know, this is the love of my life. I cannot. We sometimes do that, you know. When God knows what's best for you, I want you to know God's thoughts towards you are always good to give you the future that he wants to bless you with, the best future possible. That's his thought for Abraham. He wants to give Abraham the best. We know the end of the story. Abraham doesn't. He's walking just like us. And he just left his nephew who he thought would be his son. And now God says, look, look, Abraham, look. I'm going to give you this land. And you and your descendants and me, we're going to be there forever. We're going to be there forever. God's gifts and God's promises are without repentance. Once he tells you that, whatever promise he has made for you, I want to declare it today. I don't know what promises he has made for you, but I know the promises given me. He doesn't take it back. His promises are forever. His word goes forth and does not come back void. He seeks to accomplish the promise that he has given you, the word that he has spoken over you. Do not doubt it. Do not doubt it. He says, I will make you descendants. I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth. Wow, telling Abraham, you're going to have many descendants. And you must understand, you must understand the psychology of Abraham. He's living as a Jew, as a patriarch. 
And the most important thing of the patriarch is his lineage. You know the story of Judah, right? How so important the lineage is. You know the story of Ruth and Naomi. How important the uh, lineage is. So to Abraham, the lineage is so important. That's the major thing in my mind. And God knows what's in your mind. God knows what's in your heart. God knows what you want. I don't know what you want. I don't know what's in your heart. But God knows and he plans to give it. He plans to bless you with it. That's what I'm declaring today. He plans to give you. But Abraham, my question to you is, is this God speaking to you? Or is it your imagination? Is God telling you he's going to give you this land forever? Is God telling you your descendants are going to be like the dust? He just took Lot away. And then he says, look at all this and come on, Abraham, be reasonable. Look at your surroundings. Look at the place that you're at. Look at your wife. Has she given you a child till now? Is God speaking? Is, is Abraham hearing the voice of God? I ask you, are you hearing the voice of God? In what he's telling you to do now? In what he's sharing? In the promises that he has made you? Is it God or is it your imagination? Abraham was a young man when he started off. He was with his father. His father died. Years have gone by. Then his lot grew up. So when Lot grows up, you know, Abraham is much older, his nephew. Lot is his nephew. And Lot's property became so big, so much, that their men began fighting and they had to split. So now, you know, Abraham's in the 70s. Abraham is so much older, still no children, no descendants. So, Lot has to figure out, you know, what is God meaning by my descendants? Maybe... God wants to give me my own son or my own offering, my offering, or maybe through another means. So Abraham is starting to think. Because God says, your descendants. So what does that mean? And God says to you too, promises sometimes you don't know what it really means. You know. We start to think, could it mean this? Could it mean that? Years pass by, he has no son. So first Abraham thought, maybe from my own loins, my own son, my own this, my own that. Then after the years pass by, no son, no descendants, no fruit. But the Lord said to Abraham, what? Genesis 15, 2 to 6. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing that I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. I want you to think how Abraham thought. Look at the question Abraham is asking. I am much older now. I'm so old, Lord. Many years have passed. The dream that I had of having my own child is now fading. The dream that the promise that God made for you is now fading. You know, all the things that God has promised now become a bit uncertain. So he asked God, God, seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So he tries to rationalize and we rationalize too. I want you to know, when we find things are not going the way God promised, because God promised you the abundant life. God promised you health. God promised you security. God promised you things. You know what God promised you. But things are not going the way God promised. So we start to rationalize. We start to figure out and say, maybe it's Eliezer. Maybe the promise is coming in this way. Maybe it's coming in that way. Different from what God had organized. But Abraham asked. I want to encourage you to ask. Ask God. Follow what he tells you to do. So God, once you ask God, God will tell you. And this is the word of the Lord that came to Abraham. The one shall not be your heir. Very clear. This is not the one. So you may have a loved one, a relationship. You say, this is the one Lord. 
You know, especially when you are a single, you're looking for the person, and the Lord says, this shall not be the one. You may think this job is your job, and the Lord says, this is not the job for you. You may think this is your ministry, and the Lord says, this is ministry is not for you. You've got to understand that. When you ask the Lord, because Abraham is trying to figure out, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, because I have got this. I've got Eliezer, he's the prime minister in my household. He's the number one. He's a trusted like a brother. Maybe his children, they are born in my house. Logical. But God says no. And God will tell you also no. But he says, when I look at the background, Abraham says, what will you give me seeing I go childless? I have no offspring. So I've got no children. Lot is no longer here. Is it Eliezer? We are uncertain, not sure. So he tries to help God out. But God is clear. If we are unclear, I want you to know God is clear. He is very precise. No, but one will come from your own body. One will come from your own body. But we know what happened next, huh? We know what happened next. It came from his own body, but it wasn't the one. My question, why didn't God say, one will come from your body and Sarah's? Don't forget, he's a God who knows yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's a God who knows the end from the beginning. He could have clarified with Abraham. Why leave this? Because this will be the doubt that Abraham had. Because from his own body, never mentioning Sarah, will be your heir. This could be the basis for a misunderstanding. This could be the basis for a mistake he makes in the future. So why don't you be specific? You are a God of detail. But God doesn't give him that detail that he needs not to make the next mistake. <clears throat> God then says, Abraham, listen, after telling you it's not Eliezer, again, Abraham is discouraged. Each time we try to do something, we try to get this job. We try to do this and we get discouraged. What does God do? Come on, come on, guys. Get, get, get organized. Let's look at something. Let's, let's look at the stars this time. Let's look at the heavens this time. Start counting Abraham. What is God trying to do? God is trying to get you to meditate on his promises day and night. God is trying to get you to meditate on all that has been declared over your life. He wants you to start believing, building your faith. He does that with Abraham. Eyesight is very important. What you see is very important. Do you see what God has promised you? Do you see what the Lord has promised you in your life? Because it's going to come to pass. Abraham is going to come to pass. Abraham believed in God. Abraham believed God who spoke to him. He believed it was God that said no. Eliezer is not the one. He believed it was God who said, Lot is not the one. He believed it is God. Do you believe God has promised you those promises? Do you believe that God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Do you believe that God said you will have the abundant life? Do you believe that God said he's got a good plan for you? Do you believe that God called you from darkness into a marvelous light? Do you believe that his favor surrounds you like a shield? Do you believe all those promises that he wants to give you a good job, that he will make you the head and not the tail. Do you believe? You got to know. Because Abraham had to decide whether it was God speaking to him or he was imagining. And how do you keep believing it? Look at the stars and keep counting, keep counting, keep counting. And that kept Abraham going. But he's getting older. He's getting older and like you, he's got many questions. Is this God? That's leading me. Was releasing Lot a mistake? Was letting Lot go his way a mistake? Did I make mistakes? Because I brought Lot along. Is, is this a, was that a mistake? Because I still don't have any child. And God says, it is going to come through my body. But I'm too old. Isn't it? I am much older now. God says it's going to come through my body. My wife is very old too. So how, Lord? How? How is it God is going to come through? But the scripture says, he believed in the Lord, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He believed in his God, that God is going to give him an heir, a boy. God is going to give him a boy, a son 
from his own body. From his own body. Amazing. Read what happens next. Genesis 16, 1 to 2 and 15 and 16. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram named his son, whom Sarah, Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing what happened. You see, he looked at his circumstance and he realized Sarah, his wife, had borne no children. I waited, Lord, for your promises to come through. You said, but it didn't come through. You said, so I left. It didn't come through. I, I waited and waited and waited. It did not come through. So, he comes up with a plan. His wife comes up with a plan. Logical. Nothing wrong. He thought it was very logical. From my body, what, what did the Lord say? Because we don't want to make the mistake Adam and Eve made. Remember? Adam said, you know, do not eat of the fruit. I said, do not touch. So we don't change the word of the Lord. We stick to the word of the Lord. What did the word of the Lord say? From my body. So, so long as it's from my body, then it must be of the Lord. Isn't it? Sounds good. Falls in line with scripture. Everything is in line. Abraham is hearing God. Sometimes we too do not wait on God. We try to help God out. Be very careful when we do that. Be very careful. You must wait because it comes in your season and your season will come. But there's something that God is wanting to do in your life. God said, from my body. So can it be from Sarah's maid Hagar? Logical, still from my body. Sounds right. It fulfills the word of God. It all aligns. Is this God? God speaking to Abraham's wife? Like this pastor Chuck Pierce says, the voice of the Holy Spirit is my wife. And this Sarah's wife, Sarah is Abraham's wife. And Abraham's wife tells him, gives him good counsel. This is my maid, don't worry. But same like Eliezer. It's the same situation like Eliezer, but a bit better. Because it's from Abraham's loin. Fulfills the word of God. And then, don't forget, who restrained Sarah from having a child. God. And he did that with Abimelech's household. The whole household of Abimelech couldn't have children. You know that? Once, uh, uh, what do you call it, Abimelech wanted Sarah. God stopped the womb. That means this is the all-powerful God. Why did you stop Hagar from having Ishmael? Easy word. Just say it and it will be done. Why did an almighty God stop Hagar from having a child? If it was not part of his plan. And sometimes we too wonder why God didn't stop me if it wasn't his will. Why didn't God prevent it? In fact, Abraham in his time said, came from my body, came with the approval of my wife. There is unity. When God, when brethren dwell in unity, I command a blessing. Hallelujah! We have got Ishmael. We have got his success. And we rejoice and we begin to sing. And we begin to praise. And Abraham was excited. He gave thanks to the Lord. They began to celebrate. Oh, it was a wonderful feast. You know, now I will have many descendants through my son, Ishmael. Because we have a plan and God blessed the plan and it worked. He stopped Abimelech. I know if it wasn't his plan, he would have stopped it. I got this job. You know, God worked it out. If not, I wouldn't have got it. Now he gave me a job plus a bonus I got. Hallelujah, it must be God. I got this woman finally. I got this man finally. If not, God would have stopped it. Isn't it? Suddenly I got him. So it must be God. God is speaking. The promise is fulfilled. Oh, the promise that God had that's going to give me the oh, suddenly it's fulfilled. So I'm now going to start teaching Ishmael everything I know. I'm going to prepare him to be the patriarch. I'm going to train him. Ishmael, this is what you're going to do. From the time you're walking, I'm going to train you how to walk, how to run. You are from my flesh. Oh, what a wonderful experience. Abraham was enjoying his time. He was watching and grooming Ishmael to take over from him. And the years went by. It's not as if it stayed. The years stayed. Or time stood still. The years are going by. He has fallen in love with this young baby. You know how it is when you have a child. 
you know, those who don't have children, your nieces, your nephews, you know, it's, you, you just fall in line. Is this the will of God? Did Abraham hear right? God allowed it, and Abraham thought that God must have wanted it to be so. What do you think? Did God want Abraham to have Ishmael? What do you think? You know the end of the story. But at that time in Abraham's life, it sounds perfect. It sounds everything in, in, in place, you know. And sometimes in our lives too, it looks perfect. Everything seems to be in place. But is that the will of God for your life? That's my question. It can look the same. But good is always the enemy to the better. better. Good is always enemy to the better. God has a better plan for you, Abraham. You got to believe God. You got to follow that spirit. You got to follow that voice that is deep inside. But Abraham reasoned, well, in Abimelech's case, God stopped. But in this case, God allowed. I ask you this question. I just put this thought in your mind. Did God allow it because Abraham kept going back to God over and over again? I do not have any child. I do not have any child. And yet it was not time. It was not his season. Did God allow it? You know, in court we have, in law we have what's called a holding over order. We call it a holding over. That means until things are sorted out, you have a holding over order. Is this a holding over period for Abraham? Was it to help Abraham get through those lonely nights, wandering? Is it to fill his days so he's filled with love and excitement with this boy? He no longer has to wonder and worry about God fulfilling the promise. Because it's constantly a worry. Do you know? It's const when hope deferred makes the heart sick. Do you wear that? If your promise is deferred so long, your heart gets sick. But if you think the promise is fulfilled, Oh, you are rejoicing. You come before God with joy and happiness and wonderful things. And sometimes, this is a suggestion, I'm not declaring it. God allows holding overs. God allows that in our lives. So we get through that period. With joyfulness, with happiness, we get to fulfill certain things in our heart that we need and we've been longing for so long. Abraham was in love. Every morning was special. He bounced out a bit to see the little fella, you know, to carry him, to take him, you know, horse riding, to take him around, to show him the vineyard, to show him the sheep, to teach him how to manage the sheep. He was excited. Oh, it's my boy, my boy. Many of us have Ishmael's in our lives. It is not wrong or bad. Let me tell you, many of us have Ishmael's, different kinds, different sizes, different ages. All Ishmael's, not the perfect will of God. But something that will hold you over. Something that keeps you going. Something that says, all right, I'll live for another day. But God wants the best for you. Nothing less. God wants the best for you. And that is God's plan for you. Now read, a Abraham is 99 years old. Genesis 17, 1 to 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So Abraham now is having the time of his life. He is 99 years old, and the Lord appears to him. And the Lord tells Abraham these things. Oh, God, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to make you, you know, uh, head of the nation, the father of many nations, and you no longer, your name is going to be changed. Hey, why, Lord? Why when I'm 99, you want to change my name? Hold it, hold it, hold it. Let me get backtrack a bit. We were talking back in Haran a long time ago. We were having a chat then. And we had a talk about, uh, remember Lot uh, issue? Do you remember Eliezer? We had that issue. But you never changed my name then. 
Why do you want to change my name when I'm 99 years old? Why is there a shift? What's happening? Why must my life change at 99? Strange that God is still working on us, even though we may be 99 years old. So I don't know how old you are, how you think God is finished with you. He's not. He still works because he's got a promise that he has to bring to. But Abraham, Abraham feels that his assignment is done. Isn't it? Sometimes we also feel our assignment is over. We've done it. It's over. Thank God. It's over. I have my son. I have trained him. He's going to take over as the Metria. He's, and from Ishmael shall all the descendants of the earth be. God's going to bless me through Israel, uh, Ishmael. And we will have the land together. So I'm teaching him everything. Because it's from my body. What is in accordance to the word. As far as Abraham is concerned, that is the position. <coughs> he, and, and he tells his friends. He tells everybody around. This is my assignment. It is. Ishmael. He is the promised one. But God has something else in mind. God continues his redemptive work. Keeps renewing Abraham's mind. Getting Abraham back on track. <coughs> he changes their names. Not only Abraham. You'll see verse 9. I'm going to play. I'm going to change it shortly. He changes Sarah's name too. So God is preparing him for something new. Giving him a new title. Giving him a new understanding. A new name with a clear and definitive meaning. You know the meaning, right? Father of many nations. Mother of many nations. Is this God speaking? Abraham, change your name. Because now I've got to tell my friends all. I'm no longer Gerald, I'm Jerry. You know, difficult. You know, how do you do all that? Suddenly in your life you want to change your name. It's not ridiculous, you know. People think, you know, you may be having a midlife crisis or something. You know, but Abraham at 99 is required to change his name. But God's same thing. You're repeating this God. You told me this already. Why are you repeating it? Because it's not come to pass. No, but my assignment is over. No, God said, I have got, your assignment is not over. Abraham, there's another plan I have for you. God's focus, God is so focused, even if we lose focus of our assignment. Let's read what God tells in the next verse. Okay. Genesis 17, 15 to 21. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Excuse me, is this God? I mean, we had it, we've been through this for several years now, I'm 100 years old. Is this God? I'm at the end of my life. We retired a few years ago. Is this God trying to change my name? Have another son, a new assignment? Is this God a new job, a new relationship? Is this God? Are you hearing God? Are you imagining? Are you dreaming? Is this God speaking to you? Abraham had to make that decision. Now God is very clear. He says, I will bless you and give you a son by whom? By Sarah. Oh my. Couldn't you have told me this earlier? <laughs> After all these years. <laughs> it's not God specific. <laughs> is it in detail? The God has a plan. And his plan requires Ishmael. God has a plan, and his plan required Lot. 
God has a plan and his plan required Eliezer because all the way Abraham is learning something. His faith is growing. He couldn't take the next requirement that God has for him had he not been trained with Relot, with Eliezer, and with Ishmael. He wouldn't be able to handle the assignment that God has with regards to Isaac. But because the whole world depends on this, Abraham's walk up that mountain. We are all waiting for Abraham to fulfill that walk up that mountain. Because that becomes the example that God begins to send his beloved son for us. But it's a crucial point in, in uh, Abraham's life. Abraham says, we have a problem, Lord. We have a problem. Because I have Ishmael. <laughs> I have trained him. I love him. He's my son from my body. It was in line with the word of God. It worked so well. It is perfect. I am so used to the life I have now. Why change it? Why should I change it? I'm comfortable with the job I'm in. I'm comfortable with the ministry I have. I'm comfortable with the home that I'm in. I'm comfortable in the relationship. I am comfortable in the companies. I'm comfortable, Lord, where I am. Why change? But Abraham believes in his God. He believes that God is speaking to him. And he begins to walk the talk. He begins to walk what God tells him to do. And he declares, your season will come. I want you to know this. Your time will come and God will say, it is time, Maniam, to be a pastor. And I say, no, I have been a journalist. I'm sticking to journalism. I've been all this time a journalist. You know, the time may come, yoga, time may come that God may say, it is time now for you to do this. Anthony, it's time to leave the bank and move into the world to take over the marketplace. You never know. God says, but we say, no, we are comfortable in the civil service. We are comfortable with our pensions. We are comfortable with all the benefits we get, the perks. We are comfortable. This Isaac has not come yet. Someone say next year only. You know, and you want me to take action now? Come on, God. You know, be fair. Like I'm a man, man. You know, but Abraham listens to his God because he knows the voice of God. It's not an easy thing to hear and obey the voice of God. Immediately, Ishmael knows his God because when God declares, it will come to pass. And the covenant with Isaac, he has already named him Isaac. He has said it's going to be from Sarah. He said it's going to be next year. The promise is here. <clears throat> the assignment is here on your table. Are you going to take it? Abraham could have said, no, Lord. Many have said, no. I am happy with Ishmael. This is it. As far as I'm concerned, Ishmael is the one. Can we just settle with that? And many of us do that. At this point in our lives, we settle. And we never fulfill what God really wants for us to fulfill in our life. But Abraham said, no, I am going to follow. But Lord, let Ishmael live. What is the cry for? He didn't want Ishmael to die. Please let Ishmael live. I love him so much. I have poured so much into him. I've sacrificed so much. Oh, when you sacrifice for something or someone, let me tell you, you love that thing so much. You don't want to leave that thing. But God is saying, sorry, Abraham. You want to have Ishmael? Fine. You leave Ishmael. And I will bless Ishmael. But Isaac is the one. I'm sure he would have argued, Isaac is not here even. He's going to come next year. So might as well give it to somebody who I know. Can you love somebody who you do not know? Somebody you have never seen born. Somebody who never walked with you, never talked to you. Somebody you don't know your name. You don't know how he smiles. don't know how he laughs. You don't know all that. But you have to make a decision now to follow God. And he follows God. Now my flesh, my own flesh will not receive the land and blessing. That's what Abraham thought. You said from my own body. And this is from my body. But he's not going to receive this land and the blessing. He's going to receive something else. But Lord, just take care of him. I'm going to trust you. What if God tells you what you're doing is not the assignment? What you're doing right now is not the assignment. What if God tells you that? 
Whatever you're doing now is not the assignment. I have got now. The assignment is coming next year. How are you going to react? The assignment is something else. How, how, how are you going to? People are not going to understand. You think Abraham's neighbors thought he was thinking, right? You think Abraham's neighbors thought he was listening to God? No, they said something. You're not case. You said, Lord, no, we had to accept. Then he said, Eliezer, no. We, okay, we said, his children, you say then, no. Then when your own son, you said, hey, we all celebrated with you. We came for the party. We came for all your son. Now you say, this is not. Something is wrong with you. Man. Something is wrong with you. You know. To give up something you love, something you believe, was God's blessing, God's gift to you. God's assignment is not easy. Something, to give up someone you love is not easy. When you're with that person for so many years and God says, no, stop it. But if you want the best, then you have to do that. For many years, believing this was the promised man or the woman. For many years, believing that this is the promised assignment. For many years, believing this is the promised ministry. For many years, believing this is the promised job. This is the promised family. For many years, believing this is the promised house. And now, knowing that it's not, there is another assignment. There is this assignment. This is the true assignment. This is the true calling. This is the true ministry. This is the true house that God wants you to have. Give up something good for something God says is better. That is the call. Give up something good for what God says is something better. Will you believe God? Will you believe God? Would you believe that God has a plan for your life and he has worked it all out? Abraham had to make that call. You have to make that call. I want to tell you that Abraham made the call and he said, yes, I will Ishmael will not be the covenant child. He is not the assignment. I will live with Isaac. I will train Isaac. I will bless Isaac because he is your choice. That is the assignment. God's choice for your life is the assignment. God's will for your life is the assignment. Not the one that you love, the one that you care at the moment. So Abraham said, your will be done. Your kingdom come. But the question remains, Lord, can they both stay together? Can I see both my sons grow? Can we have an Isaac and an Ishmael living together? That is the question. Both will be blessed by God. Doesn't that seem logical and right to all of us? After all, he's a son from your own body. Why can't Isaac and Ishmael grow up together? in the same place, under the protection and guidance of, his, of Abraham. Has that occurred to you? Let's see what the Lord says. Genesis 21, 9 to 14. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Therefore she said to Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your born woman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice. For in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the born woman because he is your seed. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. What is God asking me to do? Abraham said, what is happening? Am I hearing the voice of God? Is God telling me to sacrifice Ishmael for the sake of my covenant with him? Is that the requirement? That my relationship with Ishmael ends in order for Isaac to grow and pay the covenant child. Is that the requirement, Lord? I do not agree, isn't it? It is displeasing to me. I have my wishes, I have my plans, my ideas. But God is clear. You gotta send him away. You gotta send Ishmael away. He is to leave you, never to be seen again, Abraham. It broke his heart. I had this experience many years ago. My nephew, Lot, you asked me to leave who I love. 
and it hurt me. Now you're asking for my own son. What a painful experience of removing the Ishmaels from our lives. It's a very painful experience. If it doesn't hurt you, it's not an Ishmael. Ishmaels hurt because you love your Ishmael. It was not bad. Ishmael is not a bad boy. He's a good boy. Ishmael loved Abraham, and Abraham loved Ishmael. They grew up together. Many years of hunting together, many years of training, many years of planning, many dreams that I shared. Oh, I had visions of Ishmael doing things. But Ishmael is not the assignment. Ishmael is not the covenant. Abraham's old heart began to break. It must have really ached as he obeyed the voice of God and let Ishmael go. You've got to let your Ishmaels go in order for Isaac and the covenant to come to pass. It's not easy. Sometimes we think Ishmael and Isaac should be allowed to grow together with Abraham. That's our human reasoning. And we come up with all this idea. So if I was Abraham's advisor, I would tell him, listen, listen. Yeah, God said that, no problem. Let Isaac be the covenant, but let your children stay together. God also said, you know, must look after your children. Children must honor father and mother. God is not like that. He won't ask you to do this. Yes, if we were advisors, if Rabin was advising him after studying scripture here and all that, what would you tell him? Don't be an imbecile. <laughs> Look after your child. You can't send him into the desert where he almost died with one little bit of water. We would advise him like that. You know, we think they should be left together. The Ishmaels and Isaacs in our lives should be allowed to grow together. That's our reasoning. We can take care of both. We can, enough, we can devote enough time to both. We can teach both. We can bless both. We can guide both. We can do both our job and this. We can do both assignments. We can do uh, pastoral ministry and we can do this assignment. We can look after this child and we can look after that child. Oh, we can love this woman and we can love another woman. <laughs> huh? Yeah, we think we can. <laughs> We think you can do two things. You, know? you can do so many things. God doesn't think so. That's the word for you. God doesn't think so. Ishmael and Isaac cannot dwell together. Two jobs I will do equally well. God says no. You will love one and you will hate the other. Two assignments. Maybe I have two assignments. One ministry, one politics. Isn't it? One doctoring, one cell group leader, two assignments. Pastor, one pastor, one prophet. Let's look at Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the good example. He's the Almighty God in flesh. He's all powerful and he comes down to earth. Of course, if anybody can multitask, it's Jesus Christ. Is that? He's a good example to use. He comes and he just shares the word of God. But the Jews cannot accept that because for hundreds of years they are in slavery. They are in domination. They are in control. Foreign powers, they are waiting for the Messiah to release them from this captivity of the Romans. So they ask Jesus. They keep tempting him. Jesus came to share the word of God. I come to bring the good news of the kingdom. I come to preach the good news of the kingdom. I come to share about you good news to the poor. To set the captives free to heal the broken heart. That's my message. He's got one. Come on, God, you can do two. How about some politics? Join Bursay a bit. You know? And come on, give us some temporary re relief from oppression. You could do so many things. And they asked Jesus, come on, let me ask you this question. Do we pay taxes to Caesar? That question is loaded. To challenge him to take a political position. Take a political stand. Get into politics, Jesus. And what did Jesus say? Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Rendered to God. He did not get involved. Jesus, shall we not pay taxes? Let's take silent protest. We follow Gandhi style. We protest silently. Don't pay taxes. See where they come for us. Jesus said, go and fish. The gold is there. Pay. Comply. He didn't get involved in politics. He did not get involved 
in protest. Then, in Luke chapter 12, verse 13, 14, and 15, you have there the crowds of thousands. And one man says, Lord, can you tell my brother to give the inheritance to me, to share the inheritance that belongs to my father? They want Jesus to be a lawyer. They want Jesus to be a judge. They want Jesus to play a different role, to take on a different assignment. And Jesus said, who has appointed me judge or executor of the estate? Who? I am not. I am not. And he didn't want to get involved in that. In fact, he says, listen, those who are rich towards God are truly rich. It is better to be rich towards God than to be rich in the world, which is the message of the kingdom. Jesus was focused. He functioned under one calling, one ministry, one assignment. Three and a half years he did his job and he split the scene. That's it. This is the almighty God you're talking about. You're not talking about some Samson or anybody who is also powerful. You're talking about the almighty God in flesh. If he came and he was focused on one assignment and he did not want to be distracted, can we say otherwise? If you take Daniel, he was a prime minister, one assignment. Take Joseph, what about Joseph? Joseph was a prime minister, one assignment, one calling, one child. Sometimes you think, you know, we know better than God. So we say, maybe in the ministry, yeah, the prophet, priest, and king can be one. We kabongkan satu kali. Prophet, priest, and king. Make them one. So we take Elijah and Ahab and join them. Because Ahab is the king, Elijah is the prophet. No, but God, you like Elijah? So yes, but there's another king who does his role. Elijah does his place, his role. What about David? Oh yes, David is king. That's his role. He plays that role. He cannot be prophet. Who is prophet in David's time? Nathan is the prophet, recognized. What about Saul? Uh, Saul did some numbers. He tried to be a prophet. He went to the school of prophets and tried to prophesy. You're not supposed to do that. You are king. Samuel is the prophet. Very clear, very distinct role. Samuel could have been king. I would have thought Samuel would have been a good king. But to God, one. You are the, given one task. Sometimes you think we can have two lovers, right? We can divide our love after I got a big heart. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 6, verse 24 says this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You decide whom you will serve. That's why God serves. He's all or nothing God. That's why you love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. There is no compromise. You cannot say, I love God and. There is no and. Jesus and plus plus. There is no plus. It is Jesus is worthy of it all. All is an all or nothing God. But God knows that Abraham can only be bringing up one child well. God knows he has to focus on that one and bless that one only for God's purposes to be achieved. In order for God's purposes to be achieved, Abraham has to focus on that one child. Abraham has to bless, has to, everything has to be done with regards to that one child. It's amazing. To fulfill your assignment, you need to focus on your assignment. You cannot have 10, 20 things. We all have 24 hours. Even Jesus Christ functioned within 24 hours. And if you do not focus on the assignment that God has given you, you will not achieve it. You will not fulfill it in this lifetime. You've got to find out what is the assignment, Lord, and I will fulfill it. You cannot have both. Both will compete for your time. Both will compete for your effort. Both will compete for your love. Go, both will compete for your attention. You will end up not achieving what God had planned for you. You won't hit the top. The world knows that. That's why they have specialists. You've got to specialize. You're either a cardiologist or a neurologist. You cannot say I want to be both. You will never make it. You know, 
So if you've got the best neurologist, you've got the best cardiologist. Even in that particular stream, they have very clear, distinct roles. You've got to find out what your assignment is and run with it. Abraham comes to terms with it. Okay, God, I will. And I will give up Ishmael, the love of my life. And I will start loving. And I will start focusing. And I will start devoting time. And I will start dreaming about Isaac and his future. Because that is the will of God. That is God's assignment. That is God's plan for your life. So I am going to do that, Lord, with regards to Isaac. And I will let Ishmael go. And I will get up early in the morning, though it displeased me greatly. And I will take some bread and some skin of water. And I will put it on her shoulder and give it and the boy to Hagar. And sent them away. Sent her away. Never, never to be seen again. Can you do that to your Ishmael's? Do you trust God that he will take care of your Ishmael? Whatever you love so dearly, can you trust God will take? Can't that God says do a ministry overseas? Can you trust God as your children go that they will be taken care of? Sometimes God says, give up the job that you have now. Can you trust that God will work out the things in the office? Sometimes God says, leave the job that you have security and go. Can you trust that God will work it out? So all the benefits that you're looking there, all will be taken care of. Do you trust God enough? Do you have faith in God like Abraham had faith? Trust that God will take care of your Ishmael. God will take care of your parents. Where God said, leave and cleave. Do you trust? I couldn't. And I didn't. You know? But can you trust that God will take care of your parents when you leave and cleave to your wife? Because that's the command of the Lord. You must leave and cleave in order to be blessed. Can you trust? Do you believe that God will take care of your parents? Do you believe that God will take care of the ministry if he says, no longer you are to be a pastor? Now I want you to do B, C, D. Do you believe God? God says, no longer evangelizing. Now I want you to do one, two, three, four. Do you believe that God will take care of that ministry? Do you believe? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And I'll have to stop here and continue the next time because it's very long. There's still the second part to this message. Because we only stopped at Abraham giving up her Ishmael. We haven't seen what else he must do with regards to Isaac. We will see that next week. But I want you to know that you have Ishmaels in your life. Some have lots. They haven't passed lot. They haven't even left lot. They're still with lot. They haven't reached Eliezer and they haven't come to Ishmael. These are stages, you know. You have to keep going. So if you've got lots in your life which you want to give up, because Lord, you said separate. You said to leave that. You said not to have anything to do with that. But I still want it because I love Lot so much. And I've got 101 reasons why I should have it. I want to encourage you to come and lay it at the altar and say, Lord, I am surrendering my Lot because I want what's best for me. I know the good is enemy to the bad. And if you have figured out a system and believe that Eliezer is the secret, that he is your brother, he is your friend, and his children will take, it's the promise. And you want to say, Lord, I repent of that. I'm going to surrender, Eliezer, because you have promised me, and I'm going to believe in that promise that you have given me. And I'm not going to doubt. And if then you have checked with the word of God, and you have Ishmael, and you had Ishmael for many, many years, you love Ishmael, but it's keeping you from what God wants you to do. The best in your life. The true will of God. The perfect will of God for your life. And you say, Lord, I want to surrender. I want to surrender Ishmael to you. 